puti a te rito o te harakeke, kei hia te komako e ko. Ki mai kea hau, he aham te mea nui o te ao, mā kue ki atu, he tangata, he tangata, he tangata. If you take the wee shoot out of the harakeke bush, the flax bush, where will the bellbird sing? Ask me, what is the most important thing in the world? And I will tell you, tis people, tis people, tis people. This whakatauki goes with me wherever I go. It comes from my people in Taupori in the far north, and it is something I hold deep within my heart, for people are indeed very important. My faith in God and the teachings of his son, Jesus Christ, have from birth and throughout my long life been nurtured and influenced by many, many people. Firstly, by those who raised me, and then by those whom I have been fortunate to have met on my life's journey. People are indeed important. We are celebrating the Feast of St. Thomas today, and of course, thinking about in particular for me, St Thomas's, and for others, St Thomas's Church, Freeman's Bay, which was pulled down in 1967 for a motorway at the bottom of Cook Street. I have studied notes, papers, articles, and newspaper clippings from the church archives in Parnell about St Thomas's and for this talk, and of course, I have lived through many of those times. I wish to acknowledge papers of notes left by Father Miller, David Dunningham, and Mary Herbert Nietzscheism, and others. I've also thought about the five other churches I have had long associations with, and I realised that St Thomas's Freeman's Bay definitely claims first place in my heart. And St Thomas led me to St Matthew in the city, where I have chosen to worship for the last 34 years. The intervening years were spent at St Thomas's New Lynn, where we met John Mullane in his first curacy there, St Peter's Upper Rickerton in Christchurch, and St Paul by the Sea, Milford. There's another little church, but that is for another time. My maternal grandparents were rationalists, they were Pākehā, and I loved them dearly. My maternal grandparents were baptised mihinari, which is the transliteration of the word missionary, because the early missionaries in the north were Church of England. However, many Māori became disenchanted with the way land was alienated from them due to the non-ratification of the Treaty of Waitangi, and Māori prophets arose to counteract what they saw as injustices. One such man was Wurumu Portiki Ratana, and he travelled extensively around Aotearoa in the early 1900s. And he went north and converted my grandparents. There were many in Te Hapua and Te Kao and Ahipara, where we lived. And today, they still maintain congregations, large congregations, and beautiful temples. My grandfather died in 1928 when I was born in 1932. My, grandfather, my grandmother had me baptised as Ratana. My grandmother was a very important person and role model for me, especially as far as religion was concerned, as my parents, although the best, were not churchgoers. She was a quiet, hardworking, funny, and very loving person. She never preached, but it seemed one absorbed her spirituality, natural goodness, and love through a form of osmosis. My parents decided in 1940 to leave the small settlement of Ahipara to seek a better life for our family in Auckland. Soldiers leaving to go overseas to fight in World War II meant that work was more readily available after the long depression of the 30s. There were not many Māori living in Auckland at that time, but they seemed to be concentrated in the slum areas of the inner city among Pākehā working-class people. 
We rented a very old, dilapidated house with no electricity or bathroom in Cook Street, and my sister and I had to walk through St Thomas's Church grounds from Union Street to Napier Street to attend the school now known as Freeman's Bay School. We often saw two men in long black dresses. They were Father Miller, the vicar of St Thomas, and his curate, Father Dobson. The church also had a kindergarten department downstairs in the hall, which was at the back. The school used the hall for events and sometimes even classes. Up on the hill on Hobson Street stood the, this very big stone church called St Matthew. And I was in great awe of it, having come from a little settlement, this huge stone building. To one side of it, however, was an old wooden church, which I was more comfortable with. They used to hold jumble sales there, and my mother found these very useful in providing clothing, not only for us, but for many relatives in the north. We loved hearing the bells on Sunday. My dad, who was not a churchgoer, said, before I get called up, that meant conscripted to go to war, I'll enrol you at St. At St Matthew's Sunday School. At the time, we were attending a Salvation Army group in a private house in Cook Street. A few days later, an Anglican sister from the Order of the Good Shepherd happened to visit our house and ask if we would go to the Sunday School in St Thomas's in Freeman's Bay. I will be give fervent thanks to my mother for her decision, because St Thomas began in 1942 to become a very important part of my life. Aged 10 years then, I looked forward very much to attending Sunday school, because our vicar, Father Miller, was an excellent teacher and made the lessons so exciting and interesting. Even being prepared for confirmation was interesting and exciting. We had a weekly club in the hall on Friday after school, which was also taken by the vicar. He did not have a car and had to do all his visiting and business on foot. Some of us were asked to join a junior choir, which was taken by Doris Chisholm and David Dunningham. Their great interest was music, and both played the organ, and they both created in us a love of good music and gave of their time so generously. Mrs Doris Chisholm lived at Cheltenham and used to catch a bus to the boat and then a tram to St Thomas's in Union Street, not just once, but twice on Sundays with choir practice on another day. I remember how my life and faith owes much to the activities provided by the church, the teaching and example of the clergy and the parishioners of this remarkable and much-loved church. My life revolved around my family, my church, my school, and I remember being a very happy person. In 1944, after Father Miller left and Father Caswell came from Hokotika to be joint city missioner and vicar of St Thomas's. He said his wife had, he and his wife had previously been in the church army. He set strict rules for us and we are not allowed to have or attend dances, 21sts or have weddings during Lent. If we were to make our communion on a Sunday morning, we were to be in bed by 12 o'clock the night before. To me, he was a firm, caring, hard-working, intuitive man with a good sense of humour. On a lighter note, on winter nights, Father Caswell used to drop me off on his way home from church after Evensong, until he became aware that a young man who was a server and chorister was wanting to walk me home. He said to me very quietly and with a twinkle in his eye after Evensong that night and said, don't think I need to take you home tonight, do I, Viola? Garth Port was that young man. Father Caswell saw many of the elderly living in the inner city in deplorable conditions and paying high rents. He wanted to do something about it. 
And he was fortunate that Father Miller, who was on the executive committee of the City Mission at the time, was an interested and willing supporter. Father Caswell approached Mr Kerridge, a prominent Auckland businessman, for assistance. He agreed and became Father Caswell's greatest supporter. They had a film made called Indictment about the plight of the elderly, and Kerridge had it shown in all his theatres to raise awareness and also to collect donations. Plans had been drawn up by Father Caswell for the buildings, but while Kerridge was overseas on business, he looked at other places for the elderly that were being built there and in the States. When he got home, he told Caswell to forget about the old-fashioned dormitory-like buildings and build what they were doing overseas, a type of village, cottages. And so Selwyn Village was born. Father Caswell left St Thomas's to become full-time city missioner, and we welcomed Father John Fisher, who'd been in the Torres Strait, to be our vicar and also Māori missioner. It was because we could not financially support a full-time priest that we had to share with the city mission and now the Māori mission. Father Fisher worked very hard to gather that Māori Anglicans together at St Thomas's. I could not understand why Māori wanted to have their own service at 11 o'clock when they could come to ours at 9.15 with singing, music and all the pomp and ceremony we had. I was 18, truly an assimilated brown Pākehā. I had no understanding of how important te reo, the language, and tikanga, the customs, were meant to these Māori who were fortunate to have been, retained those, although the policies of the government for Māori was assimilation. Time was to come later when I would come to fully understand and appreciate what Father Fisher's ministry meant, particularly to the Māori congregation. The people I met there, the teachings learned in those important years, enriched my life and allied with my loving home life equipped me with the skills to face the future spiritually, physically and mentally. In December 1953, after completing my teacher training, Garth and I were married at St Thomas's by Father Fisher in a nuptial mass with Father Caswell attending. Doris Chisholm was the organist and our many friends assisting as servers and choristers. It was when my mother died in 1967 that I realised when asked as the eldest in my family to thank my Fano at her tangi and that I couldn't speak te reo. It was like I feel Saul, Paul on his way to Tarsus being struck blind. I vowed and declared I would learn Māori and one day be able to stand on my marae and speak in Māori. With great support from Garth, I started to learn te reo, and it was not easy, because in 1967, the Māori Renaissance had not begun, and I found it very difficult to find a class, and it took 18 long years by myself, almost, to become fluent. I now fully understand why Māori had wanted to worship and meet and greet in their own language, in our language. In fact, all cultures wish to worship and meet and greet in their own language. As a result of my new skills in Te Reo, I was asked in 1982 by John Mullane, now vicar at St Matthews, to help the congregation with the Māori responses in the new liturgy. John was also the first vicar I remember who instigated the St Thomas's Day Mass on the 21st of December each year, usually, and this was greatly appreciated by the dwindling numbers of those of us who had worshipped and lived at St Thomas's Freeman's Bay. It is also celebrated on the 4th of July, which I know is, was Father Miller's birthday. So for tomorrow, happy birthday, Father Miller. It was St Thomas's, um, St Matthew's, who first saw in 1875 that a branch Sunday school was needed in Freeman's Bay, which was part of their parish. 
the incumbent, as the reference Hassard was known at that time, set in motion the purchasing of land and then buildings of what was to become eventually the Church of St Thomas. It seems we were born out of St Matthew's and now what is left of our spirit and some of our earthly treasures have found haven in St Matthew in the city. Some of you may already know the story of the chapel. Father Ellerton was the priest who was there before I started, and I, he was the man responsible for the chapel. He salvaged the oak panels from the chapel, which were on board the Southern Cross Five when it was scrapped and used them for wa the walls of a lady chapel in St. Thomas's Union Street. Who was this man, Father Ellerton? I'd like to give you a little bit of his character. The Reverend Father Arthur Russell Ellerton arrived from England in 1929 to be vicar of St. Thomas's and remained there until 1941 when he left to become chaplain to the forces. He'd served in the British forces in World War I and the artist rifles and was awarded a military cross. Because of his high church views, controversy often followed in his wake. When seeking a faculty for the changes to the church from Archdeacon Simkin, he was refused because of salaries owing to him and his curate, Father Peter Vokes Dudgeon, which had not been paid. After these were duly paid, a faculty was issued and work completed. Father Ellerton <coughs> then asked permission for the Bishop of Melanesia, who happened to be visiting, to bless the Lady Chapel. And because of the association of ship and chapel, this was granted. However, when the Archbishop read the Herald next morning, his anger knew no bounds. Not only was the chapel blessed, which was permissible, but the reserved sacrament and the sacristy bell had also been blessed, and they had not had a faculty. He wished the Archbishop wanted Father Ellerton, his curate, deacons and vestry dismissed immediately. However, this could not be done because of ecclesiastical procedures, and there appears no record of the matter except for a year Father Ellerton and Father Peter Vokes Dudgeon, his curate, were not permitted to celebrate Mass in any other church, and other priests were not permitted to celebrate Mass in St Thomas's. According to Father Miller, and I quote, after some time, when all the fire had gone out and the smoke disappeared, the Archbishop wrote and suggested a compromise which would make it possible for him to withdraw the ban. This happened, and Father Ellerton agreed, but it was the opinion of some at the time that he enjoyed being persecuted." End of quote. Although he left, had left St Thomas's by the time I went there, I met him on several occasions when he returned to produce a passion play in which, as a young teenager, I had a small part. Father Caswell invited him back to produce the morality play Everyman, in which Caswell played Everyman. It seems that Father Ellerton had put this play on many times, and he had played the character of Everyman. This was performed in the church, but the passion play was performed in the hall. He was indeed a charismatic person and definitely a producer who'd been and loved the theatre. He expected more than amateur performances from his cast, who were mainly parishioners and dispersed with actor friends of his. In his time, Dave Sybil Thorndike and her husband, Lewis Casson, were noted actors, and when in Auckland, they used to attend Evensong at St Thomas's, and each would read a lesson. To end this section, I would like to quote words written by David Dunningham mentioned earlier, and I quote, he opened our eyes to literature, to the theatre, to music. 
I can truly still remember the magic of Debussy's Cathedrale en Glasti, my apologies to for mispronunciation, played by Tracy Moresby on the battered old piano in the parish hall. Tracy wouldn't have been there if ARA had not the wit or the wisdom to appoint him as our choir master. Yes, and to politics. He had a lively conscience. He arranged for a number of tradespeople to use St Thomas's Hall every Monday night. Poor people could buy clothing and food cheaply. He had a social conscience and was reported in newspapers and acquired the reputation of being a left winger. Theologically, he was not a biblical scholar. The church came first, the Bible followed, oh, the New Testament. The church was central to his life of faith. We all loved and esteemed him. He enriched our lives immeasurably." End of quote. There are very few of us who worship in St Matthew and in St Thomas's, and I give thanks for the chapel in which I often sit and pray and remember. I have enjoyed throughout my life being part of and serving my family by birth, my family, the church, wherever I have chosen to be, and my life and work guided always with my faith in God and the teachings of his son, Jesus Christ. Oreida, honore, kororia, kitulunga rawa, maunga arongo kite whenua, whaka ora pai, ngā tangata katoa. Amen.